Yeah, welcome, dear colleagues, to the last session in the LIBER uh, program. This session has a particularly a dynamic, um, quasi a cheerleader title, which is all together now establishing successful collaborations. We have three contributions, um, which are about international multidisciplinary or trans-academic applications of partnerships in different areas. Um, I think that the um, papers have been uh, arranged in, um, in a range of how many people contribute. So we have 10 people who contributed to the first paper, which will be presented by three colleagues from all from the Netherlands, from different um, institutions. The first presentation will be by Laura Holling, Martijn Kleppe and Marieke von, van Erp, and will present the Dutch Cultural Artificial Intelligence Lab. Um, it will show particularly the approaches of a concept which they call polyvocality in two key projects. We are very much looking forward to your paper and uh, we will start with Laura. Thank you very much, Claudia, for the introduction. So I'm going to request access to the slides. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, so I will talk about the a new collaboration that we have a new initiative called the Cultural AI Lab. Um, this is a collaboration between uh, AI researchers and humanities scholars and heritage institutes. And we'll do this presentation with uh, with three people. So we have uh, one representing each, let's say, research direction. Uh, my name is Laura Hollink, and I would then be an AI researcher. And then there's Marike van Erp, who would be the humanity scholar, and Martijn van Klepper representing the, 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 uh, the heritage institutes. Of course, in reality, borders between these uh, three fields are not always so clear cut, right? But just to make uh, things understandable, I would say those are our roles. Um, and as uh, Claudia already said, there are many other authors from uh, uh, on, on this paper. Yeah. So I can't seem to click to the next slide. Oh, sorry. Yeah, okay, again. Um, so this, these are the partners that are currently involved in, uh, in the Cultural AI Lab. And this is our wonderful team. Um, so I wanted to put everybody on the slide here to give credit where credit is due. Uh, on the other hand, this slide is always outdated because the lab is growing. Um, so I'm pretty sure there are some people already who have already joined the lab who are not yet on this slide. Um, and then, so what is cultural AI? What, what do we want with this lab? Um, well, I would say, uh, cultural AI is um, about the development of AI systems that can handle uh, the, the complex and subtle and subjective nature of the data that we have in the humanities and in, um, in, in cultural heritage institutes. Uh, so we want to build cultural values into AI systems. And then uh, we have projects around topics like uh, bias, that, that plays a role in, in most of our projects. So bias is something that um, all humans have and that is therefore present in, I think we can claim it's present in all data that, that humanities and, and, and heritage institutes work with. Um, but that can be harmful when it becomes part of a learned model of, of an AI model. So how do we handle that? Well, one thing we do not want in this case, is to erase that. Um, in, instead, what we want to do is make it explicit, make it visible. 
Um, and we also handle questions like what, what kind of bias then, if we don't want to erase it, is acceptable in a system? Um, and how can we make that explicit to a youth, to an end user, uh, that it is there? Another topic is polyvocality. So the fact that there can be multiple perspectives in, uh, on, on the data set, on the topic in, a, in one data set. So here, uh, the question that we tackle is how do we provide access to these multiple perspectives, um, and how we make these? How do we make these multiple perspectives uh, in the data explicit to to an end user? So these kind of questions are um, they require uh, both ethics and technological answers. So. Um, to make that work, we, we collaborate closely between the research fields in the lab. So we, uh, we see the collaboration really as a two-way street. Uh, so it's AI for humanities, but also humanities for AI, uh, where both fields uh, learn from each other and both fields enrich each other. Um, so the themes that we have uh, uh, so we've clustered the projects in the lab around four themes or four research topics, uh, which could be, uh, which would be firstly context and connections. So that's about how do you link data sets together? How do you create context around an object in a heritage uh, collection by linking it to other objects? And then again, you have these same questions like, Okay, how do we make explicit to a human user that they're now looking at uh, objects from different collections, which may have different uh, quality aspects related to them? Or how do we make explicit that these links were created by AI, so by, by in automatic means, which, is, uh, which doesn't have the same quality as, um, uh, as, as maybe manually created links. Another topic uh, is trust and uh, polyfocality. So the role of heritage institutes is uh, to be a trusted source of information, or that, that's how we see that. But then on the other hand, there's these different perspectives on the information that they have. So uh, how, does, how do those two relate to each other? How can we make explicit to an end user that these different perspectives are there? Um, and how, how do we visualize that to a human user? Um, uh, then there's a topic called change and variation. So, um, especially in, 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 for example, historic collections, it displays a large role. So, if 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 language use has language use has changed over time, or if, um, uh, for example, uh, uh, perspectives have changed over time, how do we build AI tools that can handle that? Um, and then finally there's exploration and interaction. So how can we put all these things together in an intuitive and understandable way? For example, uh, what we're thinking of now is how do we create narratives of these different components? So of these heritage objects that are one, linked together, two, may represent different perspectives, and three, um, uh, uh, taking into account the change that has, that has happened throughout history. Now, concretely, um, what we have in the lab is currently four projects, uh, and we have four more projects upcoming. Um, so I won't go into each of these projects, but uh, later on in this presentation, uh, Marike will go into detail of, of, of some of them. But this is just to show you, give you an idea of um, of basically where we are in, in, in making this lab uh, something substantial. And um, we have uh, been very serious about how we, uh, how we shape this collaboration. So we have agreed that all the PhD students and researchers in the lab would spend time at academic and at heritage partners sites um, so that they, so that it becomes really, so that this, the sort of this ambitious plan of, of how the collaboration would go is, uh, um, is, uh, is, is feasible. Uh, of course, now that's very difficult to do. So we collaborate online at the moment. Um, what we plan is uh, also data sprints, which would be short periods of time where 
a group of researchers actually sit together and, and work on data. Um, we have a monthly reading club. Uh, we plan joint conferences and workshops, so visits, etc. Um, and uh, well, as I said in the beginning, we are growing. Uh, so um, uh, if you're interested in joining, then please let us know. We have a different ways or, of, of joining the lab as, as a core partner, associate partner, affiliate partner. Well, what that means is, uh, is all on our website. And then finally, we're also a member of, uh, of ICAI. That's the Innovation Center for Artificial Net, uh, Intelligence in the Netherlands. And it's an, an ecosystem of, uh, of researchers in artificial intelligence and um, usually industry. But then in our case, the, that would be the, the heritage partners. So then I give the floor to Martijn. Yeah, excellent. Um, thanks, Laura. So I'm Martijn. Let me see if I can briefly click back on the slides I requested. I think I'm controlling the slides. Yeah. Sorry, I have to click back. Yeah, thanks, Marika. Uh, so I'm Martijn Klepper. Um, really excited to share our uh, collaboration with you because I think it really fits perfect in this panel that is about collaboration. And, and as Laura mentioned, we have three perspectives and, and I'm the perspective from, from the library or the heritage field. So I work at the, at the National Library of the Netherlands uh, and used to collaborate a lot with digital humanities scholars and, and the last couple of years more and more with, with artificial intelligence scholars. And this, this, uh, this, this lab is really a perfect example where we, we we do not only uh, share our data, but really collaborate in all sorts of ways. Uh, and what I wanted to share with you is basically four ways that we uh, already uh, exploring artificial intelligence within the context of the library. And uh, the, the first perspective that we have on, on using AI is, is, is to see it as a means to, to improve the processes that we have internally. So we have a, have a large group of colleagues that are cataloging our collections. Uh, mainly doing this manually, so manually describing the contents of the book and the titles of the books in the, in the catalogs. Um, and the last couple of years, we've been experimenting with, with automating this, this describing of, of publications. Um, so we wrote a white paper about it, and we're actually also implementing right now a system that has been developed by the, the Finnish National Library, ANIF. And I think three years ago, it also won the Liber Innovation Award at this, uh, at this conference. And this is really an exciting tool that we think that it, it uh, uses all sorts of, of AI techniques to automatically analyze the contents of a book and give suggestions of keywords that correspond to our thesaurus. Uh, so this is really a way of applying AI to, to improve our internal processes. Another perspective that we have is, is to use AI to improve the services for our, for our clients or, or our customers. So we host this service for the, the public libraries in the Netherlands. It's called the online library or the online bibliotheque. You see a screenshot of here. Uh, it's a service that all, you, all members of the public libraries can use to borrow eBooks on their, uh, on their, on, on their device that they prefer. Uh, and within this platform, there's a recommender system uh, running. So if you want to borrow this book, uh, you get suggestions of other members who borrowed these kinds of books as well. Uh, this is quite an example of where we use a tool that we bought from a commercial party that hosts this, this platform. Um, but we're actually now starting a project together with Laura uh, and within the context of this lab to think about, uh, can we build responsible recommenders? So this is, a, this is a recommender system that is being developed by a commercial party and we don't really know how it works. We know it works, but it basically um, gives suggestions based on what people lend, but not on the contents of the books. And especially the contents of the books is something that we well, are very interested in because we have the contents of the book and we can do all sorts of analysis and can then also give other types of suggestions or let the, the customer sit on the, on, on the, um, the turning tables to, uh, to probably uh, to change the, the recommend, recommendations that, that you get. So this is really an example of where we want to see, can we apply AI in a responsible manner uh, so the user can uh, can can make it uh, fit to their to their needs. Now, third perspective that we have on on AI is that we also see libraries really as a platform to to discuss uh, all ongoing discussions around surrounding artificial intelligence and ethics. So, as a library, we really are a true third space, whether it be a, a physical uh, third space within the the. the the building of the library, but also digitally in the digital domain where we offer all sorts of services. 
and especially within the, the, the public library system, uh, we have 4 million uh, users in the Netherlands who are part of the public library system. It's an enormous uh, ground or, or level where you can discuss all sorts, of, uh, all sorts of issues, but also make people aware of what is, what's going on within the, within the AI field and how they can, can deal with the techniques that are, that are being offered. And a fourth perspective that we have on, on applying AI is that we want to not only use AI for services or for processes, but we also want to contribute to AI. So especially the, the, the Heritage Institutes, we, we have been digitizing our collection now for over 200 years, have enormous amounts of data, data that is not only new or recent or uh, of a high quality, but also data from uh, a century ago with words in data sets that are not being used anymore and also perspectives on history that have been changed and that have been documented in, in data sets um, uh, previous and that can be used to train uh, algorithms, uh, bringing in different perspectives and more what Laura already mentioned, uh, polyvocal nature. Uh, and I really like this quote that is also on a, on a website, right? So it's uh, cultural AI is not about is not is as much about using AI for understanding human culture, and it is about using knowledge and expertise from the humanities to analyze and improve AI uh, technology. And to give an example how we do this, I'll give the mic to Marike. All right. Um, yeah. Thank, thank you so much. So um, I'm Rika. I lead the Digital Humanities Lab at the Royal Netherlands Academy of Arts and Science Humanities Cluster. Um, now I, I think I'm maybe a bit more of a digital human, humanities scholar rather than a proper humanities scholar. Um, and I'd like to highlight two projects that we're working on. The first one is SABIO, the Social Bias Observatory, um, where Valentin Vogelmann is the main researcher. He's basically doing all the work. Um, and it's a collaborate, it's funded by the Dutch Digital Heritage Network, um, awesome organization, I highly recommend uh, having a look at that, um, together with the um, Dutch Museum for, the National Museum for Real Culture, for World Cultures, which is a collaboration between the African Museum, Volkenkunde uh, World Museum and uh, Top Museum, uh, Sudox, which is a uh, web development company, um, and, uh, and, and also DH Lab. Um, and one of the things we well, that was a starting point was the words matter, unfinished guide to word choices in the cultural heritage sector um, that was developed by one of the research um, departments of the Museum for World Cultures. Um, really what, what this publication does, it, um, a bunch of experts got together and they really looked at, you know, what are the kind of terms we use in our descriptions for museum objects. Um, and this is very painstaking work. It, it, it's very sensitive material. Um, you need the expertise of the of, of these of these people to do this. But there is so much data um, that you know maybe there's also an opportunity to use AI. And uh, so we started out developing these kind of tools in this project. Um, we first thought, hey, bias detection. But actually, as we started working on this, we thought maybe navigating is a better way of, of thinking about this. Um, and uh, also what I really want to stress is that our tools do not change the museum database at all or update or, or erase terms, but it's, it's really to present the information from the collection to, in the first instance, the museum professionals, um, maybe at later stages to the public as well uh, and to provide this context and to say, well, maybe, maybe you want to look at it from, from this perspective. Um, what we also find very, very important is that we want to avoid a black box. So um, we explicitly do not want to use, um, uh, for example, at the moment, these deep learning um, uh, algorithms because they're just completely untraceable. So we actually took a step back and um, try to go for the kind of tools that, um, that we can sort of still trace. I mean, of course, you put millions and millions of objects in there. Um, this, you know, it's a large computation, but, you know, this is the formula we use for um, one of the tools we have. Um, and then basically the way we thought about it is to, um, to when we present, when, when we want people to, to look at the collection, um, to use it as sort of a re-ranking. Um, so, present the objects in a different order, grouped by 
um, potentially how biased um, they are given certain markets. Um, and in this um, uh, overview, what you see is um, you type in a keyword, for example, colonial, you can filter by start date and end date, which is sort of, you know, um, uh, the date of the, uh, the objects in the collection, you can maybe filter on location. Then there are different engines or different ways of re-ranking the results um, and a vocabulary that says, well, these are the kind of dimensions that I'm interested in. Um, so you, for example, see servant, slave, Batavia, which was the colonial name for Jakarta, um, Mumbai or um, Himbaling, which, um, God, what's the term in English? Uh, I, I don't know, but it's like kind of inhabited, but a bit of a derogatory term. Um, and then the visualization shows you sort of where objects are, are clustered together and score high on some of these terms. Um, and you can click on an object and then see the information. Um, this is very much work in progress. Uh, we hope to release this uh, at the end of the month, first version. Um, and we would like to also invite people then to work with us and see if they can get their data into this um, and test it and see if it makes sense for them to navigate bias in their collections that way as well. I'm running a little bit out of time, so I'm just going to highlight um, the Kong Kong Core data set um, that we're building, which we uh, received a, a grant for from the Europeana Tech Challenge for Europeana AI um, machine learning data sets. Um, so uh, Valentin and I are involved in this um, from DH Lab together with Ryan, who's a PhD student, who's working in a project together with Andre and Laura um, on, on a different project. So um, it's really actually even between the, the different funded projects, there's collaborations happening. And basically what we want to do here is to create an annotated data set of contentious terms um, from the Europeana newspapers to really understand this concept of bias or, or contentiousness better um, and to maybe also start creating machine learning algorithms that can help detect these. Um, I'm just going to flip over this. Um, so basically we ask people, um, given a term that could potentially be contentious and a sentence, bef the, the sentence that occurs in the sentence before and after, would you say it can, it's contentious? Would you use it in an email today? Terms you can think of are um, terms that also occur in the words matter. That was one of the, 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 the seed lists. We, we amended that also with input from experts. Um, and uh, we basically asked 3,000, uh, we had 3,000 of these sentences. Uh, we had participants from my research institute who, who have, a, you know, historians, linguists who have some of that extra background. And then we also used a crowdsourcing platform and every sheet was given, or every sentence has at least seven people who said, I find this contentious or I don't find this contentious. Um, we're very much up to our ears in processing the data now. So I don't have any conclusive results for you. We do see some interesting patterns in there, but I highly um, recommend and invite you to join us in two weeks where Andre, uh, one of our PhD students, We'll actually talk about this during another presentation, um, giving it a bit more time and attention that, um, that it deserves. Um, but we just really wanted to tell you about all these different things that are happening in our lab. Um, so I'll make sure the link is posted so you can join that. Um, so just to quickly wrap up, um, it's a collaboration across eight different Dutch research and cultural heritage institutions. We started in the Netherlands, but if you're from somewhere else and you think, hey, this is cool, please do get in touch with us. We really want these teams to be highly interdisciplinary um, uh, across different, um, uh, you know, even from computer science, different disciplines, but also from heritage um, and the different research things. We're highly, highly data and user driven, and we hope this really fits. Uh, we think it's all together now. Uh, we hope you think so too. Um, this is how you can reach us. Thank you so much for your attention. Yeah, thank you, the three of you, for a really uh, interesting and inspiring contribution. And I think it is extremely future oriented and it gives a lot of um, positive insights um, into cultural heritage. 
Um, I'm always impressed by the huge amount of digital data which are available and making what you called so nicely navigation possible in all different ways. I think that is a huge, huge task which we all have for the future. I also liked very much the stress which you put on ethics and on um, trust and on responsibility. And um, again, I think it is a big challenge to make this information not only navigatable and accessible, but also understandable and bridge all these different language and culture gaps which we do have and which make understanding so difficult. Um, for the time being, I don't see a question in the chat, by, but I would like to know how you, uh, um, how do you, how happy are you with the response of the public? Because uh, I see that you have some crowdsourcing aspects within your projects, you also invite for discussions. Are you getting a high response there or is it, well, it is quite a specialist, large, large area. How difficult or how easy is it to get um, excited people work with you? Um, so far, the response has been overwhelmingly positive um uh so uh we're very very lucky in the netherlands that uh, that we have the national library on board who have this amazing network and also the dutch digital heritage network um has i think over 70 cultural heritage institutions um in its network and there's lots lots of experts there dealing with big data um also we've actually had a long-standing collaboration between universities and heritage institutions. So this, this really grew and, and, and we're just feeding that. Um, then um, as for, for example, our crowdsourcing task, um, within just a few days, we had 400 annotations. We were really worried, like this is gonna take forever, but you know, there's a boom. Um, when we, um, also asked our colleagues, you know, uh, uh, or, um, within the Sabio project, for example, we've done an online workshop with museum professionals to, to really, you know, touch base on, well, what's, you know, does this make sense? This kind of way of thinking about this, um, uh, like loads of people showed up and, and were like, please let us know what's happening. Um, I think there's a real, as all these institutes are really digitizing loads, um, mm -hmm. they are also running into all these problems and um, not having someone who uh, just, you know, goes in and just, you know, runs algorithms on it without the their the domain experts input because that's a really stupid thing to do, but it does happen sometimes. Um, I think I think that's just super fruitful, and 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 also I think people realise this is just too complex to uh, to try to solve within the different disciplines. Yeah. And I so can you want to say something? Yeah, no, <clears throat> I was thinking about what you just said, uh, Marie, and, and if I can briefly answer that, especially what you just mentioned, right? So, so we, we within within institutes we have technical expertise, but we mainly have domain expertise, right? And that's that's what I really like about this collaboration. What what Lara also mentioned is that we really take the, the starting point that the researchers are part time working at academia, part time working at the institutes, and and we have some experience with that with, with previous programs where where PhD students are actually in our offices, sitting right next to our domain experts and, uh, and programmers we have. And that works so perfect because it's uh, um, that, that's something that you notice right now, the digital era that we now live in is, is this, this interpersonal relationship that you built up by, by just sitting right beside each other. It's so important to help each other, but also to, to build up your knowledge for us, the technical knowledge for the, for the, um, uh, for the scientific um, uh, researchers, also the domain knowledge and it's really this, this well, this, this collaboration that works perfect by, by doing it on the job in the office. Yeah. So we have uh, two questions from the chat. One is from Lucille Grant. How did you choose the 3000 extracts which you uh, submitted for crowdsourcing? 
So actually, I already typed the answer in the chat, um, but we okay. had uh, a set of terms um, from the Words Matter project, as well as from some, some domain experts that we sampled against the collection. Um, then we uh, looked across six decades of, and took 200 random samples from that. And then from those 700 um, articles, what we did, we, we did a bit of sampling for typicality um, of context. Um, I mean, exceptions are very important to take into account, but because we had limited time and limited funds, we kind of wanted to make sure that we had a bit of a uh, set that was a bit more representative, perhaps, also to filter out some of the OCR. Um, so, you know, that led us to 3,000 extracts, but we've got another uh, 67,000 if we find some more budget to hire annotators. Okay, and um, I suppose that the programs which you develop in this context will be made available to other projects as well. Um, yeah, they'll be just released open source on GitHub. Uh, so we're okay. currently working on the documentation and uh, it should be um, available um, via our websites and European tag in a few weeks. Um, can you foresee already what this means for research in certain areas? I think that this will be quite a revolution to get access to huge masses of content, isn't it? Laura, do you want to answer that question? Maybe? I'm sorry, I was just reading the previous, reading up <laughs> on the previous question. Could you repeat the question, please? Well, I said it um, with this kind of analysis, it will be probably be a revolution in quite a number of expert domains. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, so the, the way I see it is that um, uh, what we're, what we're, on a high level, what we're trying to do is in a way to, to sort of formalize these guidelines by the museum on how to treat these terms ethically. And one of the ways we do that is by trying to um, build a data set um, that you can use to train a machine to do this automatically. Mm -hmm. And I think um, to test that approach on this data set and then maybe also on other data set, yeah, I think that is quite a, a big step. And we're all the way, we're, we're very much at the beginning of that. Mm -hmm. And it is an appropriate time to do it with all these discussion about uh, appropriation of cultural heritage. I think language has a big role to play here and can be in extremely helpful to um, allow bridging or at least navigation, well, whatsoever. Anyway, thank you very much for a very, very exciting uh, paper. We will now come to the second speaker in our um, in our session, who is um, Adram uh, Sofroniec from the University Library in Belgrade, a long-term colleague of mine. We cooperated a lot with in Lieber and also discussing about the Consortium of European Research Libraries. Adam uh, speaks for a group of five colleagues from um, four different countries, if I see well, and he will present to us the collaboration of academic libraries across four countries of the Western Balkans, Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro and Northern Macedonia. I pronounce it in the German way. The aim is to make cultural heritage accessible to the public and the academic libraries combine their resources and share their experiences in order to reach wider audiences. Um, Adam has a big background in digitization and skill developments and this is the basis for the work and the presentation um, he does on this collaboration and resource sharing across countries. Adam, good luck. Thank you very much. Uh, it is a great pleasure to have uh, 
Claudia is a pre, uh, uh, moderator for this session, as we are, uh, as she mentioned, long uh, term colleagues and friends from the Liber. So I'm very happy for this uh, opportunity to present in the session which Claudia is uh, moderating. Uh, I will share my screen now with uh, everyone. Uh, uh, okay. So, uh, I'll be happy to use the next uh, 20 minutes, let's say, uh, to present the uh, work uh, these libraries and other libraries from the region uh, done on um, collaborating and uh, making uh, library network in Western Balkans uh, function and uh, provide uh, more uh, services, more resources to uh, our users. I wish to thank uh, each one of uh, co-authors and colleagues from um, uh, different libraries across Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Northern Macedonia for uh, collaboration in past years and on this uh, uh, paper that I'm presenting today. Um, and again, to, 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 to express my sorrow because uh, we couldn't meet physically in Belgrade or some other place, uh, uh, but uh, uh, at least we have this um, virtual opportunity to share our uh, uh, work in the past and uh, uh, present uh, our accomplishments. Um, okay. Um, so we have uh, three main areas of collaboration that uh, I will be presenting today. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, these are, uh, these range from the very traditional uh, li library, library thing, which is the uh, shared system for library automation uh, and cataloging through also a uh, 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 pretty traditional thing which uh, deal for academic libraries at least, which uh, deals with PhD thesis. And then finally, digitization of cultural heritage, which is also traditional in the sense that uh, uh, libraries do it uh, uh, for a long time now, but the, um, the, the execution of this uh, uh, varies uh, as we heard in the previous uh, uh, presentation from just making pictures, which is a thing that we did 20 years ago to IE and uh, IE enhanced um, enhancement of pictures and uh, uh, basic digitized materials. So uh, these are the three areas I will be presenting. Uh, for the first, uh, for the first one, um, uh, I will be speaking briefly about uh, uh, the system uh, of uh, cooperative online bibliographic system and services that we deal with, uh, you know, uh, that we all use in the, the, these four countries and in academic libraries in these four countries. Uh, it's basically an organizational model of joining libraries uh, at both national and regional level. Uh, around the shared system for cataloging. Uh, there are many features of this COBIS system, union uh, bibliographic catalog database, local bibliographic databases of each participating library authority database and many other stuff. Um, uh, I will just briefly, briefly, briefly speak about this system and, and work that has been done in the past based on this system and possibilities that lie ahead uh, for some, some, some of the countries that still did not implement those possibilities. So basically this system covers several, uh, several states in Western Balkans, some other states beside the fourth, the four, the four state I, uh, I will be speaking today. It's created by uh, uh, Institute of Information Science in Sizum in Maribor. At the moment, uh, 1,400 libraries are in the system. Most of them are from Slovenia, then uh, many of them from Serbia, and then uh, from other countries as well. Dozens of libraries from other countries as well. At the moment, uh, 12 and a half million records uh, have been created in databases of national systems. Uh, again, following the following the. Uh, uh, the disposition of number of libraries, Slovenia is leading the way with 5.6 million 
records. Serbia is trailing with 3.5 million uh, uh, records, and then other countries uh, in hundreds of thousands of, uh, of records. Um, what is the what is the uh, the, the point of uh, speaking about uh, this system and collaboration through this system? One thing is that bibliographic records have been exchanged. Uh, almost 800,000 uh, records have been exchanged in the past 15 years. Uh, also, this is the basis for networking of the of the colleagues from both uh, academic and public libraries. Uh, uh, Hobbies conference is held annually, uh, uh, and it's a place where colleagues meet and speak and discuss their issues. Uh, and uh, the, 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 the most important thing about uh, 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 this system being an infrastructure for uh, fostering collaboration, it, it, it uh, is uh, actively used to foster experience and knowledge sharing. And um, in my opinion, um, uh, the mere thing that we're using the same system in those different countries that are divided by uh, contentious history near that, that is uh, in the near past and also in the past uh, is a great thing uh, that we can meet each other and say, yeah, we are working in the same system, how it's going with you, how is this going with you? Uh, is, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, a big step forward in uh, making collaboration easier. And uh, I think it's very important for libraries in Western Balkan countries to collaborate because uh, this, uh, and especially academic libraries, to collaborate because this uh, allows for uh, greater chances of collaboration between scientists and researchers uh, and uh, whole societies in the, in the, uh, in the end. Uh, and this COBI system, in my opinion, uh, provides provides uh, a basis for this uh, noble task. Uh, noble task, in my opinion, important task and task that is very needed in, in Western Balkans. Um, um, the other the other uh, subject that I want to to, to 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 talk about is the promotion of PhD thesis in academic libraries across these four countries. Uh, it has been kick-started by a Tempus project. Uh, Tempus project is an uh, uh, EU-funded um, project opportunity for higher education. Uh, in 2010 till 2012, a project uh, New Library Services at Western Balkan Universities has been executed uh, and coordinated by University Library in Belgrade. Um, uh, it encompassed academic libraries from Serbia, Bosnia, Herzegovina, and Montenegro. And the uh, uh, main results of the project uh, have been the network of repositories that provide for safeguarding of doctoral dissertations and efficient presentation of these dissertations to the general public. Uh, this is the, the this project uh, built a basic infrastructure dealing with the PhD thesis and then. Uh, 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 after the end of the project, nine years ago, uh, 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 libraries and uh, universities work, uh, very, worked very hard uh, to, to advance this basic infrastructure that was provided by this project and to, to, improve, uh, to improve the ability of the general public to access the, access the PhD thesis. And this is, uh, 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 I must emphasize, an important cornerstone for open access and open uh, science in uh, those countries, uh, at those universities, and those scientific communities that, uh, that rely on this uh, digital infrastructure heavily to, 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 to foster and to develop further uh, open science uh, in uh, uh, in the past nine years, as I said, and the future, of course, uh, as well. Uh, I will mention the, that this infrastructure allowed for uh, joining of uh, Serbia, at least, to, to European uh, network of uh, uh, PhD thesis repositories, DART. Um, and this is one concrete result of how, how, how uh, collaboration between librarians can Foster, foster access to, to uh, scientific materials uh, and especially important one, ones as the PhD thesis. Um, 
And now to the third, uh, uh, to the third subject that I want to speak to you today, and that is the uh, sharing of uh, infrastructures and sharing of experiences and sharing of materials uh, 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 that uh, we may uh, uh, label as uh, cultural heritage materials. Um, the subject for this, the, the basic for this is obviously digitization and uh, at the moment uh, we have the infrastructure in place uh, that is um, um, uh, uh, rely on Petraživa uh, RS, that's the internet address, you can look it up uh, uh, yourself, uh, 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 which encompass 600,000 pages and plus we are adding materials every day. In Metz Alto format, uh, this specific format allows for uh, such key keyword searchability, keyword searchable feature of this library, which is the uh, very important feature, bringing um, uh, bringing uh, novelty to researchers and general public. This is the largest and the only substantial existing collection of keyword searchable materials in Western Balkans, and we are very proud of this because it's uh, not. Uh, uh, just the effort of University Library Belgrade, far from it, it's a very collaborative effort of many libraries and especially libraries uh, of the colleagues who co-authored this uh, paper today. They uh, all personally uh, added to the collaboration through this, um, through this uh, infrastructure and I uh, think we all together made uh, uh, substantial uh, result in uh, allowing public and researchers as well, uh, researchers from communities and social sciences in the first place, uh, uh, so, so that they can access the materials in an efficient way, in an effective way, which is most important. Uh, this uh, keyword searchable library also originated from a, a European project uh, that uh, I can be proud uh, of saying uh, we, we, we got into through Liber. That's an important thing to mention at this point. Uh, it was a project entitled European Newspapers, a Gateway to European Newspapers Online. It ran uh, from to, uh, 2012 to 2015. And uh, uh, in this project, we acquired the first Metzalto, Metzalto files in Serbia and in the region. And afterwards, University Library Belgrade uh, built uh, in its own capacity the system for preservation and presentation of these files. And then afterwards, acquired the means for their production, uh, uh, concretely DocWorks software that we're using up until this day. Uh, um, and uh, by this, we uh, connected all the elements needed to have the full, full, full circle from creation of digital images to presentation of digital images to users. And I must emphasize again in an efficient and effective way. Uh, many libraries in the region have uh, uh, hundreds of thousands, millions of pictures. And uh, 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 we hope and our mission is to persuade them uh, and we are doing this for the past 10 years that uh, enhancement is needed uh, of these materials and that we must progress digitization projects toward uh, keyword searchability and uh, to, so to provide the users with the effective way of accessing uh, materials. Uh, uh, this has all been achieved through several national projects financed by Serbian Ministry of Culture. Um, uh, and uh, through the relation between participating, uh, uh, though relation between participating libraries remain loose, I think this is a, this is a very solid basis for the collaboration in the future as well, because this is an existing infrastructure, digital infrastructure that is used every day. We have uh, uh, more than four thousand unique users each month from all over the region and the world. Um, University Library of Belgrade maintains and upgrades the system within uh, its own operation and uh, 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 participating libraries provide the initiative for adding of materials from their collection uh, and these additions uh, 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 and these uh, initiatives trigger different activities. Some of them are conducted through everyday work through operation, usual operation of libraries, and some of them trigger uh, 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 projects 
that they had a substantial amount of new materials. Uh, the important thing is that uh, materials are added uh, uh, on a daily basis. So almost uh, at least each week we have a new small collection with thousands of pages added. Um, uh, and this, uh, this has been uh, 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 the main part due to collaborative effort and uh, these uh, inputs that we get, get from uh, many, many libraries in Serbia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, Montenegro, Northern Macedonia. To, 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 to make materials available to users. And uh, uh, it, it is of enormous importance because when materials are really used and you know that you're doing something that will have effect uh, 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 tomorrow, that somebody will be using it for his or her academic research, then uh, you have uh, uh, more uh, zeal and more, uh, more uh, 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 effective um, uh, working conditions for yourself and your team uh, to, to, um, to, 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 to be efficient at your work. Uh, I must highlight once again the importance that such, uh, such a digitization, digitization in such a framework have for uh, social science and humanities scholars. Uh, this is a game changer for them uh, because now they can uh, find materials that they used months and months uh, of search efforts, now they can find those materials in uh, mere minutes or hours. Uh, so this uh, this collaboration provides a research paradigm shift in Western Balkans, uh, but it also uh, connects dots in the process of digitization of cultural heritage, uh, from pictures to enhanced materials. Uh, and now that we have this model, I think it's more uh, clear to all colleagues from academic libraries in Western Balkans how, how uh, digitization processes can be, uh, can be um, uh, executed. And uh, uh, this by itself is, uh, is an additional benefit uh, of the collaboration we have. Uh, also, we can uh, uh, have uh, each library, big or small, find its place in the great process of digitization of cultural heritage. Uh, uh, now that we have this infrastructure in the in the place, so uh, so I think uh, it's also very important. Um, uh, it allows for scalable projects. Uh, uh, Activities based on this uh, infrastructure can be uh, based on the regular working processes of small, medium, and large uh, uh, libraries, but it also provides framework for, for projects, local, national, regional, international projects, and also for more networking, which I think is in the heart of the, of the success of this initiative. Um, and uh, I can present uh, uh, at the end of, the, uh, of my uh, presentation one interesting way that uh, we uh, found very effective in using this digital infrastructure to promote further collaboration among libraries and also among nations and peoples. Uh, uh, because <clears throat> once that you have uh, uh, effective, uh, effective and efficient um, uh, access to digital materials, people start to use these materials. So the, the, the interest uh, in certain user groups is sparked, in, uh, also in general public. Uh, and this is based on creation of thematic digital exhibition collections based on materials available in this big uh, keyword searchable library, uh, again, uh, uh, accessible at the internet address pretraživa.rs. Uh, one such example uh, that we created very recently is a collection of 400 and more journal articles on Belgium. Uh, uh, it, uh, it was uh, uh, two weeks of work for us to present, to, to create this uh, specific uh, presentation exhibition collection, and it's available on an address that uh, you can see and. Uh, uh, I guess everyone who is interested in relations between Serbia and Belgium can 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 use this place to find uh, all the materials uh, already in place. So so we use this uh, enhanced, let's say, 
preparation uh, to, 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 to make materials even more available to user. Because when you type in the keyword Belgium, you have 4,000 4, results. And you can find out of those 4,000 results what you need. But as a librarians, we can go a step beyond this and, 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 and even further uh, enhance these materials uh, by hand at this moment. Uh, what we are hoping for in the future, and again, to, 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 to connect with the previous presentation, I hope to use IE in the process of uh, uh, in the process of um, uh, uh, further filtering out the materials, uh, and that's something in the future that awaits uh, us. Twelve more than twelve collections have been created uh, in this manner, uh, and you can see those those exhibitions of various issues, topics, countries, cities, personalities uh, at the address uh, available here. Uh, and uh, some of those uh, uh, virtual collections or exhibitions have been made uh, in participation with the colleagues who co-authored this work, and these were especially uh, successful, and I thank them all uh, and on this occasion for their, for their input on uh, which, uh, which uh, topics to select. Um, yeah, this is the final slide, I think. Uh, um, I just can thank everyone again for the great collaboration we had in the past and hope to hope to spark interest in other colleagues, other library, academic libraries across Western Balkans to join this initiative uh, so we can be even more efficient in the future. Um, thank you very much. I have, have, I think, five more minutes for the question if there are some questions. Well, thank you, first of all, um, Adam, for this interesting tour um, through the Western Balkans and the achievements of the last years. I think um, you pointed out very well to us how everything started with a cataloging network to go to a digital library and how from the digital library we can derive particular resources for humanities or culture, but also investigate in new methods of um, getting deeper insights into these collections. I think you have been extremely successful in bringing all these participants um, together and uh, networking uh, with them and thus building a Western Balkan universe, I would say, um, which now is accessible everywhere. And I think especially for what you mentioned last, these uh, virtual exhibitions, it's worthwhile giving a look at them and learning a lot about this uh, area and uh, different cultural aspects. And again, they bridge into all our collections because there is a lot of common cultural heritage distributed among European libraries and digital libraries are a wonderful way to reunite it or to uh, explore all this wealth. And you already mentioned that you will have um, contacts with um, the Netherlands project. I think there are, a, uh, there are huge opportunities for your project to uh, go deeper into uh, applications of artificial intelligence, which may make things even more, um, even more communicable um, among different publics. Do we have a question for Adam in the chat? I would have just one, Adam, which is about the contribution of the um, Western Balkan libraries. Um, is it their free decision to participate in this digital library or um, is this their mainstream activity? Do they automatically, automatically, well, do they all contribute to this digital library or do they build up separate digital libraries as well? Uh, uh, we have this one uh, digital library that is a central place for uh, all digital materials. Uh, uh, and then, uh, 
obviously each library uh, 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 can decide if they want to build their own digital library uh, in parallel uh, so it, uh, the, 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 the very positive thing about uh, this initiative is, is that uh, allows for a very scalable approach mm -hmm. very scalable approach which is very important in western balkans because there are variations there are libraries with the uh, 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 such as University Library in Belgrade, we have many European projects participating in these projects. Uh, these projects allow us to, to, to digitize hundreds of thousands of pages, etc. And then you have smaller libraries uh, which, which uh, cannot, uh, uh, does not have the capacity for such a, a big uh, digitization project, but still can add some important uh, inputs and uh, we, we are very happy to help them to provide their input, however uh, a small number of pages is, uh, the, the, the content of these pages is very valuable um, and um, uh, worthwhile saving for the future generations. Yeah. Well, it's uh, for sure an important service because running such a digital library is a huge task and involves a lot of also not only expertise, but also financial involvement especially when it is about uh, safekeeping it for the future. So it's, uh, it's a very good thing. Well, thank you very much, Adam. Thank you all your, to all your contributors whom we have not seen. And we all remember that we would have loved to be in Belgrade and to see all of you in person and to visit not only the digital library, but the physical library. But as we cannot do this, um, the more we should profit from the fact that there is this digital library up and running. And I would encourage all our more than 50 participants here to go and have a look and at this achievement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we are now coming to the last and third presentation. It is from Lucia Barnes and it focuses on the community led open publication infrastructure for monographs project. A long, complicated sounding word. It is a three year international project which brings together libraries, open access publishers, researchers, and infrastructure providers to build open non-profit community governed infrastructures to expand and to make flourish the publication of open access books. Um, it's a particular aspect uh, for the scholarly community, Lucy, and something which is extremely important for the next development of, um, of, of uh, humanities and research, but also publication. And we are looking forward to your presentation. Hi, everybody. I'm just going to share my slides. There we go. Um, thanks, Claudia, for that introduction, and thanks to Lieber for inviting me to speak today. Um, I, my name is Lucy Barnes, and I'm an editor and outreach coordinator at Open Book Publishers, which is um, an academic-led uh, non-profit open access book publisher. And I also work on the COPEM project. As Claudia mentioned, it has a very long title, which we shorten uh, to call it COPEM, as it's easier. Um, and I, I do outreach work for COPEM, so I'm going to talk about COPEM and collaboration today. Um, so I'm going to give you kind of an overview of COPIM, which is a collaborative project building infrastructure to support open access books. I'm going to talk about the structure of the project, our approach to the work and what we've achieved so far. And I'm going to focus on what's most relevant to libraries. So this uh, slide is basically the consortium partners. So these are the key members of COPIM. Um, and as you can see, we've got universities, we've got university libraries, we've got open access presses. Um, and we've got infrastructure providers. Um, and these are based in different countries. So we've got um, members in the United States, in the UK, and in different European countries as well. Um, and they're also different types of institutions. So you've got the presses, the universities, the infrastructure providers, and the libraries. So there's different types of, of collaboration going on there. Um, and it's a three-year project which began in at the end of 2019 and is scheduled to finish um, towards the end of 2022 next year. 
It's funded by Research England, by Arcadia and by the consortium partners who were on the previous slide. And we're trying to enable the development of open access book publishing by creating open and community governed infrastructures. So I'll talk a bit more about that. And before I sort of launch into the detail, I just wanted to draw your attention to this open documentation site. Um, it's on PubPub, you can see the address there. And this is where we share um, in-depth documentation about the project as it's continuing. Part of um, our kind of attitude to the project and to the fact that we're all invested in open and being open is that we want to try to be as open as possible about the work as it's progressing. Um, so we have updates, we have workshop reports, we have um, all sorts of different kinds of updates about what's going on and, and how we're working. And I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to go and to have a look at that. Um, as I talk in more detail about some of the aspects of the project, I'm going to share links to the PubPub site where um, individual projects have their documentation grouped separately. So you can go and find out more if you're interested in particular aspects. And there's also the, the project website, which is kind of a more overarching uh, website where you can see about the structure of the project and you can see who's involved. But the, the open documentation site is really where the detail is. Um, and we're interested in, in open and we're interested in open access, but we also think that infrastructures that support open access should likewise be open. We want to try and create infrastructures that aren't controlled or dominated by one particular institution or one particular company. We want to create um, infrastructures that aren't owned privately, but that are governed collectively and collaboratively by the academic community, which hopefully those infrastructures will serve. So what are some of the problems that COPEM is trying to address? So as we see it, there are problems with closed access content. Um, obvious, obviously there's problems with physical content because if you have a book which is um, in, a, in a university library, it's not going to be as accessible as um, an open access book which is freely available online for anybody to read. Um, and there are also some issues with closed access ebook content. Um, I know that there are campaigns currently underway in the UK, in Canada and in Ireland, and there may be more that I'm not aware of, which are trying to raise awareness of some of the issues of closed access ebook content. Um, there's issues of patchy provision, so you don't always have an ebook for a particular book. There are issues of cost, there are issues of restrictive licensing, there are issues where publishers are trying to encourage um, libraries to sign up to a single platform for ebook content, or perhaps to um, subscribe to a bundle of ebooks when they may only want one. I'm sure um, you know this audience is well aware of these problems. And so some librarians have suggested that open access is therefore potentially a solution. But of course there are unsatisfactory open access solutions as well. Um, book processing charges in our view are um, an unsustainable way to fund open access books. Um, they're also inequitable because if you can't access the funding for a book processing charge then you're not able to publish open access. And so-called transformative agreements similarly benefit limit, a limited number of parties, particularly I'm thinking about the large um, transformative agreements that you see with, with larger presses. You know, then a large chunk of the library budget is going to one publisher, which isn't necessarily good from a bibliodiversity point of view. And you have, um, you know, if you're, if you're at an institution that doesn't have a transformative agreement, you can't take advantage of it. Or if you want to publish with a press that doesn't have a transformative agreement with the library and so on. So we want to create open alternatives to this that enable greater participation. We want to create a more diverse open access ecosystem that supports more authors, more readers, more libraries and more publishers. And I think it's important then that COPEM, you know, the, the, the partners within COPEM are not competitors with each other. That's not how we're kind of approaching this work. Um, we're trying to create alternatives to things like BPCs, to, to so-called transformative agreements, to these sorts of monopolistic systems through collaboration. And that's how we're kind of approaching the work. And that's summarized quite nicely in this quote by Joe Deville, who's one of the, the COPIM members. Um, he says, our view is that the success of open access depends utterly on open and inclusive forms of collaboration to enable the creation of infrastructures that respond to the diverse needs of different users. And so with that in mind, this is the kind of the structure of COPEM's work. Um, and you can see there it's, it's seven different work packages focusing on different types of infrastructure. Um, and I should say that these different types of infrastructure are, are, we envision the whole thing working in a kind of modular way. So it's not the case that if you're interested in, in one part of this, that you would therefore have to kind of subscribe to all of it. We want it certainly to be interoperable so that the different aspects can work together, but we also want it to be possible for people to participate in one aspect of this, of this project, if that's um, what they want to do. 
And I think perhaps uh, bearing in mind some of the, the things that have been said in other presentations, it's worth maybe me just saying a little bit about how we work together collaboratively. Um, so the project management side of things, that obviously is more of a kind of internal work package and I'm part of that work package and we try and support all of the individual work packages that are working on their different things um, to try and help us to work together better, to try and help us to, to do outreach like I'm doing right now. Um, and basically to try and make sure that everything works smoothly. And then the individual work packages are led by different people. Some people will work on more than one work package. So there's a kind of collaboration there as well. Um, and if there are particular uh, work packages that might work together more easily or where there's more crossover, then they will have kind of regular meetings with each other to make that work. And then we also have a kind of overarching project meeting every month where we all get together virtually to discuss how it's going and to share um, updates and to, to see, you know, where there are areas where we could be working together better. Um, but in terms of what I'm going to talk about today, um, just for reasons of time, I'm not going to talk about all of these. I'm just going to talk about the four which I think are most relevant to libraries. So that's the revenue infrastructures and management platform, the open dissemination system that we're building, um, the alternative business models that we're piloting, and the archiving and digital preservation infrastructure that we're working on. So there are four key challenges that these four work packages are trying to address. Um, obviously, there's kind of more to it than just these four, but these are the kind of crucial um, problems that they're trying to hurdle. So the first is funding channels. So if I've suggested that we think book processing charges and transformative agreements are not the way that we would like to see open access books funded, we need alternative funding channels that enable um, publishers to have a sustainable income stream while they do their work. And we also need appropriate business models. So if I'm a closed access publisher making my money through selling access to closed access content, how can I transition to open access um, in a way which, which gives me a sustainable income stream? And then integration into libraries, repositories and digital learning environments. So if we have a whole huge number of open access books, that's great. But if nobody knows that they're there, if they're not catalogued properly, if they're not part of institutions catalogues, then, you know, nobody's going to be able to find them or use them effectively. And then we have um, the effective and robust archiving of open access content. So obviously an open access book is going to be a digital object. Um, it might have embedded audio, it might have embedded video, it will almost certainly have links to external um, resources and, and sources of information or, or articles or databases. So how do we archive these books so that that, that kind of complete package is, is archived in some way and how can we, how can we do that? So the revenue infrastructure is a management platform. Um, I should say on the left here, I'm going to put each, each work package's leader or leaders. That there's more um, people involved in the work package, but they're the key, the key people. And then at the bottom for each one, I'm going to put the link, as I mentioned, to the PubPub site. So if you're interested in finding out more, that's, that's where you can go. So the vision for the revenue infra infrastructures and management platform package is basically we want to create a consortial library information and funding platform for open access books. So this platform will showcase open access publishers. It will showcase groups of open access publishers, like, for example, the scholar led consortium, and it will provide information on open access books. And it will also enable funding flows as well. So libraries will be able to choose whether to support an individual open access publisher, whether to support a group such as scholar led, or whether they want to create their own bespoke combination um, in whatever form that takes. And so far, um, we've undertaken workshops with over 120 publishers and libraries and a number of countries across the US, the UK and Europe. And I don't know if anybody was at the OASPA um, and LIBA uh, session yesterday on collaboration, but I was struck there by something that Alexandra Jobman of Enable mentioned. And she discussed how to create effective collaborations based on trust and mentioned that working in small groups of stakeholders and working together on topics is, is one of the ways to do this. And I immediately thought of, of the workshops that we've been undertaking with COPEN. Um, each work package basically has had this stage of, of doing, undertaking workshops, doing research, having conversations, and then bringing that together into um, a scoping report. And that kind of work has then underpinned the practical developments that have taken place on top. So this work package um, has undertaken two uh, scoping reports, um, academic libraries and open access books in Europe, a landscape study. And that was done in collaboration with OPRES. So again, an example of COPEM trying to collaborate with others. And then the, this one's called the promise of collaboration, collective funding models and the integration of open access books into libraries. Um, and the, the platform then is, is currently in the stages of it's, it's being scoped with the developers and the governance model for the platform is being devised. So how are we going to 
um, structure the governance of it, how are the decisions about how it's going to work going to be made. And so that's currently underway. And then we have the knowledge exchange and piloting alternative business models. And again, if you were at the session yesterday, you'll have heard Martin Eve talking about this. Um, so the vision for this work package is to have to, to be able to transition the business models of at least two non open access book publishers to a new open access model. And also to create an online open source toolkit that can guide others through the process of booting up and running an open access book press. And so far, the model has been devised. It's called Opening the Future, and it enables library subscription to a closed access backlist, which then supports the publication of an open access front list. So if you're a library, you subscribe to a press's backlist, which is closed access. So the subscription gets you access to that backlist. But the revenue from the subscription is then put into creating open access books. So effectively, you're gradually opening the, uh, the output of the press to open access. And we have two presses um, so far who've signed up and begun implementing this model, Central European University Press and Liverpool University Press. And the first open access book from the model has already been funded. And there's also a scoping report that we've created, Revenue Models for Open Access Monographs 2020, which is a really thorough taxonomy of different ways that open access presses can generate revenue to support their work. And then we have building an open dissemination system. So the vision for this is to build an open dissemination system that enhances the discovery of open access books using open metadata. Um, we want to have a pilot case where the infrastructure is built and it's then implemented with the open access presses within COPEM and that we create a best practices digital catalog that will enable adoption by others. And so far this system has been built, it's called DOF. It's fully operational with Punctum Books and with open book publishers. So their metadata management is now fully um, done by this system that we've built. And we're in discussion with other presses um, who are not part of COPIM to adopt um, this uh, system. And actually Media Studies Press this week um, have announced that they're going to be participating and working with Thoth. There's again, a scoping report has been published and workshops have been undertaken as well for this, for this work package. And then finally, we've got the archiving and digital preservation um, work, work package. And the vision for this one is to create the technical methods to effectively archive complex digital research publications. Um, we want to have a pilot case where a subset of publications are archived in different locations. So that will be Loughborough University Library, um, University of California Santa Barbara Library and the British Library who are all partners in COPEM. Um, and we want to have a model that will enable the expansion and the uptake of the methods by other presses and libraries. So each work package also has this aspect to it where we want to try and make it as easy as possible to to roll out the work that we're doing so that more presses um, or more organizations can can benefit from it and that we can kind of encourage the uptake of more the uptake of, of what we're doing the work that we're doing by more more organizations um, and this work package um, intentionally began six months later than the others so it's still in that kind of scoping um, phase and it's undertaken workshops with um, people or organizations including Cambridge University Library, Educopia, the Internet Archive, Library of Congress and Portico um, and its scoping report is in progress and I think it's quite close to publication now um, so hopefully there'll be some news about that soon. And I sort of wanted to finish really just on um, a note to talk about the, the, the kind of collaboration and support that kind of runs throughout um, COPIM. So libraries are involved in COPIM at all levels. They are members of the consortia, they participate in our workshops, we've consulted with libraries, there are librarians on our advisory board, and they also are assisting with the implementation of what we're doing. And the future of the infrastructure that we build and the approach to open access book publishing that we want to foster depends on support from libraries. Um, you know, if we build these things and then libraries aren't interested or, or don't want to, to participate in them, then we're not going to get very far. So the whole um, project really from its inception um, has, been, has been built on a collaborative approach. Um, and that's something that we are trying to, to carry forward um, as we go. So my last slide is just to say, please stay in touch with that in mind. Um, we have the open documentation site that I've highlighted. We have our website. There's also uh, a Twitter account where we put all of our updates, anything that happens, we're gonna tweet about it. And there's an email address there that you can get in touch with us um, via this email address. So if there's anything you think we should be bearing in mind what, as, as, we, as we're doing what we're doing, if you want to get in touch um, potentially to um, suggest another collaboration that we could be usefully engaging in, then please get in touch um, and let us know. Thank you.
Yeah, thank you very much, Lucy, um, for this deep insight into the open access uh, future um, in a cooperative uh, way. And I think we are all very eager to visit your website and to read in detail a number of reports and very interesting uh, findings which, which you had throughout the project. I thank you also for inviting um, us to participate in uh, different areas. And I think that's something um, which is important for all kind of collaboration to take into account what is happening and to make sure that um, the own ideas um, are voiced in this context if, if they fit into, into the model. So, um, well, thank you very much. And um, I think that is uh, an important step uh, for open access publications. Um, I'm looking at the chat to see whether somebody has a question for Lucy, but I think people first have to digest this wealth of information which you gave to us. In the meantime, I would like to um, maybe ask you about um, the complex digital research publication, because I think that will be very much an um, something which will occupy us um, that digital um, publications can grow quite uh, differently from uh, traditionally um, published uh, publications. Uh, are there particular aspects in this project where you want to uh, tackle the specificities specificities of these complex digital research um, publications or what do you understand by this? Yeah, so first I should say that as I am involved in the outreach aspect of things, I'm not closely involved with any particular work package. So in terms of detail, the, the pub pub is a good place to go. But certainly I can say that um, I think there's a recognition on, in that within that work package that open access books can be extremely complex objects. So um, my press, Open Book Publishers, uh, recently published a book which was based entirely on um, a database. It was the Let's Kind of Medieval Nordic Law, and it's based on a database of Nordic law terminology. And so as an archivist, then you might be thinking, well, how do we, how do we archive this if it's based on a database which is growing and which is changing? How do we deal with versioning? How do we think about... Um, you know, do we have to archive the database in order to effectively archive the book or is the book just a snapshot of that database? Um, so these are questions that, that the work package is currently grappling with. And also, of course, the idea of, of link rot. So if you are linking out to other external sources that you yourself don't have any control over, how can you make sure that, that the essential aspects of that, uh, that other resource which is being linked to is preserved? As a press, open book publishers um, archives links via the Wayback Machine, and that's one way we are trying to tackle that problem. But of course, you know, that's that's a solution, not necessarily an ideal solution. And so one of the things that this work package is, is thinking about and working on is, can we create um, alternatives, um, better alternatives to some of these workarounds? And because that, that work package involves a press um, and a library, the University of uh, Loughborough's library and um, open book publishers at the kind of two leads on that um, then you've got the two working together to think about from each side how can we best tackle this problem yeah yeah thank you very much there is another question in the chat now um, which alternatives coping foresees to the book processing charges uh, you mentioned that there is a new approach to them um, what is this approach which alternatives do you see i think you mentioned one but yeah. yeah, sure. So um, it's quite an interesting time, actually, for the development of consortial funding um, programs. Again, Open Book Publishers for uh, since 2015 has had a, a library membership program. So the way that we fund our open access publications is not via a book processing charge. Um, it's a mixed funding model. So we sell physical copies of our books. We generate revenue from that. Um, we have a, a library membership program where libraries contribute, it's currently £300 a year, I'm not quite sure what the euro equivalent is, but roughly similar, um, to support our work, and that enables us um, not to charge authors, and we also, if authors are able to, to access grants, that also supports our work, but you don't have to have a grant to be able to publish with us. 
Um, and so that's one way of doing it, a kind of mixed model like that. Um, the work package, which is, is thinking about the platform for libraries, that's that's basically a, a kind of enabling that sort of, of funding flow from libraries. So um, as, open, as Open Book Publishers has, has its own library membership program, this platform might enable more presses to be thinking in that way and perhaps to, to band together to present themselves on that platform as a consortium and to say to libraries, if you su um, support us, then you're supporting, say, six different presses with your, with your support. And then opening the future is, is a different alternative to that book processing charge. So that one uh, is, is, a, is the one where the presses are flipping to open access, but they have a closed access backlist that they can use to generate revenue um, via subscription. And then that revenue can go towards supporting the publication of open access front list. So in the, all of those different models, you're not charging individual authors. You're not putting all of the cost onto one person or one institution. You're spreading that cost and spreading that load. Yeah. Yeah, well, I think we all have to learn it is not for free, all this publication. It involves a lot of people, a lot of salaries have to be paid. So uh, somebody has to pay the bill. And um, this idea about spreading it all out as much as possible is certainly um, a way to, 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 get, uh, to get better um, financing of this kind of initiatives. Um, I would come back to um, the issue of the databases. There, are, uh, there is a term which is close to my heart and which is often databases. And sometimes I think, oh, indeed, in the past, people would have published a book and well, not one, maybe 10 or 20. Now they published a database, but the database is no longer supported and it becomes often. And is there a way where um, this kind of um, open access publishing of monographs or databases or whatsoever, and uh, the problem of um, often databases may converge? Well, I mean, it's it's a tricky question. I suppose again, this is something that that work, the work package on archiving is is thinking about and is trying to solve. Um, I suppose you might think of the open access book as itself a form of preserving that database, certainly at a given moment in time. Mm -hmm. um, it's not obviously necessarily going to capture updates unless you then issue another edition. So it's an interesting question because that book was released last year. So whether in two or three years time, it might be worthwhile to release a second updated edition. That is, is itself in a way a, a form of preservation. Um, but I think my my technical expertise in terms of databases wouldn't stretch to me hazarding an, an answer beyond that to that question, unfortunately. Yeah, well, nevertheless, I think we got a lot of um, incentives to think about. I have a comment from Haley, uh, thanks to Lucy and the project for building bridges between libraries and publishers for indeed fostering trust through respect respectful dialogue. And I think that's very much what has been the underlying um, uh, the underlying uh, idea of all our three uh, presentations. Um, as Adam put it, we have a noble task to accomplish. We can only do it today through collaboration. Collaboration allows for us exploration, variation, interaction, navigation, all these words we heard a lot throughout our um, session this afternoon. And this must be done in mutual trust, in shared responsibility, which is, after all, true cooperation. And I think um, the best we um, are able to carry the, this on, the better our projects will evolve and our uh, future and our common heritage will be shared. I thank you all for this uh, cooperative spirit and your work in all these projects for presenting this afternoon. And I think we all say uh, goodbye to the conference and to LIBA and uh, we are Happy also that within LIBA, we have a possibility to share these expertises, to share our knowledge about these projects. So I wish you a happy weekend and thank you very much.
come back to the screen, all my presenters, and we say back uh, goodbye to the audience. Goodbye, everyone. It was Bye, thank, thank you. you. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye.